Following the defeat of Nobunaga in Hanoji Temple, a large chain of events was set in motion that led to the slow but sure rise of Hideyoshi Toyotomi and the eventual resurrection of Fortinbras. Over a period of 14 years, Hideyoshi would unite the country under his rule and eventually work with the Genma Triumvirate to incite the emergence of the Omen Star, which occurs in 1596. This large time gap allows many new characters to be introduced, like Akane and Mitsunari, while most older characters like Sekishusai and Oyu are forced to stop for one reason or another. However, once Hideyoshi successfully united Japan, there were quite a few years without incident, especially considering that he doesn't utilise the Genma until 1596, the same year that the Omen Star actually appeared. It isn't until around 1595 that Mitsunari released the Triumvirate, leading to them making a deal with Hideyoshi to unseal the Omen Star from the Underworld, but with his growing obsession with the Genma's power, it isn't hard to imagine that Mitsunari could have given into temptation and unsealed the Genma far sooner. So what would have happened if Mitsunari actually did so? If he came into contact with the Triumvirate earlier than normal, how would have events changed following an early appearance of the Omen Star? Following the infamous Sword Hunt of 1588, Mitsunari began to look towards further ways of keeping the populace from inciting an uprising, expecting this to not be enough to pacify the peasantry. Having already seen the fear instilled in the hearts of man by the Genma during the reign of Nobunaga, he begins to research ways to make contact with them under Hideyoshi's nose. In 1590, he successfully frees the Genma Triumvirate and puts them in contact with Hideyoshi, leading to the promise of godhood in exchange for unsealing the Omen Star and resurrecting the God of Light. However, having soon learned that his wife Nine was unable to conceive, therefore unable to give him an heir, she was chosen as the sacrifice to create the Genma Mother Tree, a decision made even easier after the birth of his first son, Surumasu Toyotomi, a year prior. As a result, Yodo remained untouched as Hideyoshi grew much more fond of his concubine following Surumasu's birth. This allows Ophelia to take Nine's form, though keeping up appearances for the public is rather simple, since Hideyoshi seems to prioritise Yodo during public appearances. Unfortunately, Surumasu would succumb to illness only a year later, but knowing that Yodo is capable of conceiving unlike his wife, he still treasures her as he hopes to try again. With his alliance with the Genma now secured, Hideyoshi commissions the construction of the Toyokuni Research Facility in both Sakai and Shimabara, and Rosencrantz becomes the head of Genma Research, possessing Louise Freus while Claudius inhabits the body of Mitsunari. By 1592, the facilities are completed and the Dark Stones placed inside, and with the Genma trees beginning to blossom and produce Genma insects, the seal of the Omen Star is broken, causing the Genma to begin emerging en masse. This is just in time for Hideyoshi's Korean invasion, as he decides to distribute the insects among his forces in order to strengthen them. However, when told to consume them, Hideyasu Yuki vehemently refuses, seeing the effects they have on the rest of Hideyoshi's forces and deeming them to be abominable. While Hideyasu's defiance annoys his father, Hideyoshi decides that Hideyasu's power is sufficient enough for the invasion and sends him with them. As he fights the war in Korea, the savagery of Toyotomi's forces scars him even more than usual, the Genma insects inflating their violent instincts further than he even thought possible. While he is able to survive the war and return to Japan, he doesn't even return to Hideyoshi in Kyoto this time, instead completely deserting Hideyoshi in sheer disgust and hatred. Upon witnessing the resurgence of the Genma when he returns, he doesn't lay down his arms, and over the next year, instead decides to immediately fight back against his father, hunting down the Genma trees and burning them wherever he can find them, quickly gaining his Soki nickname. This is noticed by Tenkai and Arin, who are quick to not only realise that the newly restored Genma are now immune to human weaponry, but that Soki is, in fact, the Black Oni. While Tenkai is certain that Soki is not yet strong enough on his own, he is uncertain who else can assist him, so he decides to pay a visit to the Yagyu village in Yamato province. 
Surprised to see Tenkai again after 20 years, Sekishusai unfortunately gives the same reasoning as in the manga as to why he is unable to fight the Genma anymore, instead needing to oversee the training of the next generation. Though understanding his reasoning, Tenkai can't help but be a little confused, asking whether or not a Yagyu has already been chosen to succeed him. Sekishusai lowers his head with a hint of shame and tells of the betrayal they suffered four years prior, revealing that his youngest son, Muninori, had committed a massacre on the Yagyu after being deemed the strongest of his generation, fleeing the village and joining Hideyoshi. Tenkai offers his condolences and wishes Sekishusai luck with the next generation, and Sekishusai asks Tenkai for one last favour – to slay Muninori if their paths do cross in the near future. Tenkai agrees and bids Sekishusai farewell, realising that with no Yagyu aid available to him, he has no choice but to become directly involved in events himself, deciding to intercept Soki in Osaka. Remember, Akane was only 13 when she completed her Yagyu training and became Jubei in 1597, so with her only being around 9 years old at this point, she would be too young to have any involvement whatsoever. What would also not happen is the assassination attempt at the behest of Hidetada Tokugawa, again because he is too young at this point to be thinking so obsessively about securing his place as his father's heir to the Tokugawa clan, him being only 14 at this point. As a result, Soki reaches Osaka unhindered, Tenkai also arriving at around the same time, though since she is also too young right now, he is not working alongside Okuni so Tenkai immediately seeks Soki out upon arrival. It doesn't take long for the two to meet, Tenkai recognising Soki as the Oni of the Ash, though Soki asserts that it is little more than a nickname, certain that he has no relation to the Oni. Tenkai disagrees, identifying him as the Black Oni and asking for an alliance in their fight against the Genma. Soki remains steadfast in his belief that defeating Hideyoshi is his own responsibility, but Tenkai warns that he is by no means strong enough to defeat him on his own. As Soki asks what Tenkai would suggest, the Dark Stone in the Toyokuni facility activates, the light that reaches the Omen Star drawing everybody's attention. As this happens, Tenkai senses the presence of Mitsunari, donning his red Oni mask and asking Soki to help him, Soki agreeing given his own poor experiences with the man during his childhood. The two both face off against Claudius, the Genma already now in primary control of Mitsunari's body, and are actually able to come out the victors here thanks to Soki's aid, forcing the Genma to retreat, though not without warning them that they won't be able to stop him as he vanishes. With the fight over, Tenkai suggests that they flee Osaka, though when the sun rises the next morning and the Dark Zone triggers a shockwave that heavily damages the city, Soki decides to rush back in an attempt to save any survivors. As a mother is trying to escape a horde of Genma with her newborn, she is saved by an arriving Soki, who immediately begins tearing through the hordes while Tenkai helps her evacuate, shocked at Soki's display of power as he destroys the Genma giants. Once they escape Osaka, Soki confidently asks if Tenkai still thinks he isn't strong enough, but Tenkai says that he unfortunately is not, suggesting that Soki return with him to Mount Hiei in order to make a plan to stop Hideyoshi. While Soki wants to immediately confront Hideyoshi now, Tenkai stresses that they need more help first, while also promising that they may find a way to make him even stronger, this being enough to convince him. Tenkai telepathically contacts Arin to inform her of recent events, and she is quick to welcome Soki once they reach Enryaku Temple, also able to recognise him as the Black Oni. Soki, however, is still uncertain what that actually means, so Arin explains that he is the reincarnation of the Oni God of Darkness, making him the most powerful Oni to exist, though he currently only possesses a fraction of that power. Soki is quick to ask how to unlock his full power, but the two are not willing to tell him just yet, causing increasing frustration in him. Tenkai is quick to assert that such power would be overwhelming, so much so that Soki could risk losing control of it and becoming a threat to all. He begins to speak of Sogen Osho and Murakoto, 
telling of Sogun's death at the hands of his ally when he transformed into an out of control Onimusha, forcing Sogun to use his final moments to seal his former ally as a desperate final precaution. While he says that he'd turn his sword on himself before an innocent, Soki is able to understand why they are so cautious and backs down, though he stresses that time is short, revealing Hideyoshi's atrocities during the Continental Invasion. While they are not yet able to make any large moves against Hideyoshi, Tenkai agrees to aid Soki in hunting the Genma trees, asking how it is that he actually tracks them. Soki says that he simply follows rumours and intercepts them whenever he can, and both Tenkai and Arin agree that a more reliable method would be ideal. Arin is quick to suggest getting in contact with the Mino clan to help them, and Tenkai asks her to contact them in order to obtain more aid. Once again, with this currently taking place four years earlier than normal, Minokichi would likely be too young to become involved in events, so Arin instead recruits a Mino that they've already met, the Mino that aided both Samanosuke and Jacques against Nobunaga. As this Mino has no official name, we will from now on refer to him as Minosuke. As he is neither getting married nor expecting a child at this point, he agrees to aid the Oni once again. With Minosuke now using his Mino contacts to help in tracking the trees, Soki and Tenkai prepare to follow his information and begin burning them. Before they leave, however, Arin calls their attention to Soki's second sword, Requiem, identifying it as an Oni purification sword. Still hoping to see the victims saved rather than sacrificed, she asks Soki to try and use it to purify the trees before burning them, Soki agreeing since that would be the preferred outcome. The two Oni are soon able to intercept a cart of trees near Omi province thanks to Minosuke's information, quickly dispatching the Genma that guard it. With the threat passed, Tenkai steps back as Soki draws Requiem and drives it into one of the trees, watching as the dark essence within dissipates until the tree itself is no more, leaving the victims trapped within now finally freed from their morbid confinement. With this success, Soki purifies the rest of the trees and frees their victims, leaving them to escape. Now knowing that they are able to actually rescue those turned into Genma trees, Soki and Tenkai work with Minosuke to find and purify more. In mid-1593, the Oni are able to track a convoy of trees to Saruga, this convoy being led by Danyamon. Similar to Kanon, Soki steps out and stops the convoy, challenging Danyamon while Tenkai cuts the supports holding up the wooden structure, causing it to block the convoy's escape. With the two having already built up a reputation for interfering with Hideyoshi's trees, Danyamon is quick to recognise his foes and accepts Soki's challenge, only to be just as easily defeated alongside the present Genma. Following this win, the two begin purifying the trees, something that is noticed by a nearby Muninori and Ohatsu. While Muninori drags his feet a bit on the idea of fighting the two, he notices a slightly hopeful look on Ohatsu's face as she recognises Soki, deciding that he wants to toy with them for a while before telling her that they're leaving. Over the next few weeks, the Oni continue to hunt and purify Genma trees, until Minosuke informs them that a large concentration seems to be gathering in a fortress in Sata Pass. While they both hope to be able to infiltrate it and purify the trees within, landing a large blow to Hideyoshi's efforts, they agree that a full assault would be a poor decision. However, Arin is quick to suggest that she warp in when they reach the entrance and open it from the inside, granting them easy entry. The Oni agree and begin their assault, with Soki and Tenkai drawing the guards out while Arin keeps watch, warping inside to open the gate in a similarly playful manner as Jubei does in canon. With the gate now open, she smiles and wishes them luck as she warps to safety, leaving the Oni to continue their mission. The two are soon able to reach the roof where they encounter Muninori waiting for them, warning that he will cut down anyone who defies Hideyoshi. However, with no Jubei present this time, both of them prepare to fight him off, at least until Tenkai tells Soki to go ahead and take care of the trees while he handles the rogue Yagyu. While Soki doesn't want to leave Tenkai alone to face Muninori, he's fought alongside him enough to know that Tenkai is more than capable of handling himself and agrees to rush ahead. Muninori, however, is unbothered and begins looking forward to seeing how the infamous Purifier fares against him, the two soon beginning their clash. As Soki enters the warehouse and prepares to deal with the trees, 
he is caught by surprise by a familiar voice calling his name, turning to see Ohatsu standing there, this time not holding him at gunpoint. While he is happy to see her, Ohatsu is rather on edge as she recounts her witnessing of Soki and Tenkai's actions in Suruga, asking what it is that they actually did. Soki is surprised to know that she was there and asks why she didn't say anything then, but Ohatsu hesitates before saying that she just couldn't. It doesn't take Soki long to work out that Munanori is likely involved and demands to know what he did, but Ohatsu quickly changes the topic back to the trees, asking if he can really purify them. Seeing the desperate look on her face, Soki draws Requiem and offers to show her, driving it into the nearest tree and purifying it, freeing its victims. With her face shifting from shocked to slightly more hopeful, she asks him to do the same to her, requesting him to purify her while he has the chance, but Soki just stops in confusion, asking her what she's talking about, but she further begs him to do so quickly before Munanori returns. The urgency in her voice is enough to convince him to do so and he uses Requiem to purify her, shocked to see a similar dark essence dissipate from her before removing his blade. As Ohatsu catches her breath, she takes the chance to check her body, only to realise that she is no longer contaminated, tearfully thanking Soki and revealing that Munanori had forced her to ingest Genma insects to prevent her from betraying Hideyoshi. With her now free of his control, Soki asks if she can fight, Ohatsu drawing her Tangeshima rifle and promising to gun down Munanori, the two telling the already freed captives to remain until they return. The battle between Munanori and Tenkai is rather even, with the Yagyu's skill and speed being difficult for Tenkai to overcome, but as Munanori is about to lunge forward for another attack, he is forced back by gunshots, looking over to see Soki and Ohatsu glaring at him. He just laughs at first, asking if she's forgotten her place, but Ohatsu just shoots again, telling him that she's not his pet anymore. Munanori's grin drops when he remembers Soki's second sword, realising that he must have purified her and promises dire consequences, fleeing what would be an impossible 3v1 battle. With Munanori gone, Tenkai is given the rundown and he is happy to have gained a new ally, able to sense that she has the power necessary to kill Genma. Again, whether he senses an inherent Genma power from her uncle, or an Oni power, is down to whether or not we want to use my old theory about her and her family. With Munanori no longer a problem, the three return to the warehouse and begin purifying the rest of the trees and freeing the captives. Once the last of them are purified, Tenkai stays with them while Soki and Ohatsu handle the rest of the Genma in the fortress, clearing a path for them to safely escape. The Oni return once the Genma are beaten and collectively lead them out of the fortress, taking them to the town of Suruga in order for them to be able to make the necessary preparations to return to their respective homes. Following this success, the three return to Mount Hiei and inform Arin, happy not only to hear of the mass purification, but also to meet a new ally in Ohatsu, helping her make a new set of armour since her baggy clothes are no longer necessary. It's during this downtime that Soki receives his first visit from Fortinbras, but while Ohatsu doesn't notice anything, Tenkai and Arin are able to sense something and break contact, warning that his presence doesn't feel right. The group soon discuss their next move, and Tenkai is quick to mention that they'll need more help from someone else, telling of the captive Roberto in the dungeons of Sawayama. While Ohatsu mentions that she knows the castle well due to her being there during her slavery to Munanori, she expects that he has likely warned Mitsunari of her defection, so they'll need to find another way inside. They arrive in Sawayama and immediately encounter the Genma Guardian, slaying it and discovering the hole it created leading to the dungeons, though they expect that the fight had likely drawn Mitsunari's attention. Since they don't have anyone with Jubei's speed, they decide to have Soki be the decoy since his raw strength will likely attract a lot of attention, so he remains in town to draw the Genma out while Tenkai and Ohatsu search the dungeons. They soon reach Roberto, and Ohatsu leads the conversation, asking if he needs help escaping, and while Roberto stops for a second upon seeing her, he says that they went through too much trouble and breaks his own chains. As he is about to leave, Ohatsu is quick to ask for his help, but he is focused on killing Luis, Tenkai translating for her. 
She offers to help him in exchange for his own aid, and given that he finds himself a bit smitten with her, asks what they want. Tenkai then takes over and explains their goals in Spanish, revealing his knowledge of the exercising beat, surprising the Westerner. Roberto eventually agrees, but makes it clear that he will be taking no orders from them, Tenkai agreeing to these terms. He relays this to Ohatsu who thanks him, Roberto simply sighing in response. With this alliance set, he leads the two through the secret passage towards the castle keep, missing their first encounter with Sakon and taking both Claudius and Rosencrantz by surprise. The two activate the wooden trap door and flee, not wanting to fight outnumbered, leaving the Oni to defeat the trapped Hakuba clone. They soon find Soki and they all return to Mount Hiei to prepare their next move, with Roberto remaining cold towards the rest of the party, still annoyed that his target escaped. Soki is quick to suggest that they make a direct attack on Hideyoshi, but Tenkai is a little unsure whether they are strong enough, but Arin soon steps in and suggests that Soki is ready to unlock his power as the Black Oni. Tenkai agrees that now is the time, and they tell him of the trial of the Oni Gate, as well as the time limit. Soki is glad to finally have a chance at closing the gap between himself and Hideyoshi and enters, and it once again goes the same as canon, with Soki breaking open the gate after initially running out of time. Everyone present is baffled at his new display of strength, and they agree that with this new development, now is a good time to interrupt the Daigo Blossoming Festival. Like canon, they reach the Akechi tomb and split up before meeting back up at the temple entrance, entering to encounter Claudius, Rosencrantz and Muninori. Unsurprisingly, Roberto is quick to rush at his target, and while Ohatsu tries to rein him in, Soki and Tenkai confront Muninori and Claudius, though the latter is quick to taunt Soki into rushing towards Hideyoshi alone, leaving Tenkai to face the two on his own. This becomes especially worrisome when Sakon approaches him, though luckily for Tenkai, Claudius and Muninori are content to simply sit back and watch the show. Claudius wanting to see if Sakon's worth keeping around, and Muninori simply not enjoying the idea of fighting. As a result, while the two sit back and mock the Oni, Tenkai is still able to defeat Sakon, and Claudius decides to step in himself. While having trouble keeping up with Roberto, Ohatsu overhears the sounds of battle behind her and is forced to rush back to aid Tenkai against Claudius and Mitsunari, arriving just in time to see Muninori preparing to join the fight. As he draws his swords, Ohatsu rains gunfire in both of their directions, forcing them to momentarily back off and give Tenkai a moment to breathe. Annoyed at her interference, Muninori decides to focus on her, grimly promising to make her regret betraying him in Saruga, leaving Claudius to face Tenkai alone. Ohatsu doesn't respond to his taunting and simply keeps firing, but Muninori's speed and skill is enough to avoid her gunfire for a while, eventually managing to close the distance between them and take a few swings. While the first couple Ohatsu is able to block with her rifle, the third manages to hit its target, breaking her armour and wounding her as she screams in pain. And with Tenkai still fighting Claudius, he isn't able to break away and back her up, leaving her at the Yagyu's mercy. Muninori cackles at this display, asking if she really thought she could beat him in a straight fight, only to notice her try to raise her weapon and fire again, stepping down on her arm to stop her. After continuing to mock her, he prepares to deliver the final blow, only to hear yelling coming from his left as he takes a heavy punch to the face from an incoming Roberto, rushing back after having heard Ohatsu's cries. Given that he's already started falling for her, he simply couldn't resist running to her aid after hearing her screaming, and he continues his relentless assault on Muninori, the latter taken by surprise at his strength as he defends himself. With the battle once again becoming a 2v2, Tenkai and Roberto are able to work together to fight off Claudius and Muninori, the former now worried upon realising that Roberto possesses the exercising beads, and they eventually decide to retreat. The Oni are quick to check Ohatsu's wounds and patch up what they can, thankful to see that her new armour took the brunt of the attack. Once they're able to stop the bleeding and get her on her feet, Tenkai stresses that Soki will not be able to face Hideyoshi alone and tells them that they need to catch up to him. Roberto is clearly angry for having let his target escape to save Ohatsu, but she is insistent on finding Soki, so he begrudgingly concedes to going with them as they rush off. As for Soki, his confrontation with Hideyoshi is rather similar, though Hideyoshi is more fixated on the incoming birth of his heir, 
keeping Yodo by his side while he ascends to godhood. Yodo herself, however, is noticeably more nervous when addressed, giving very quick one-word answers just to move the conversation along, something that Soki quietly notices as he drops his facade to challenge Hideyoshi. With his Black Oni power fully unlocked, Hideyoshi's attempt to toy with him leaves him falling behind, so he is forced to use his full power in order to fight on an even plane. As the fight goes on, however, Soki slowly begins to flag as he starts having trouble maintaining his Black Onimusha form, while Hideyoshi's power remains constant, and as the rest of the party reach him, Soki is left beaten before Hideyoshi. As they try to help him up, Yodo and Ohatsu are quick to notice each other and both call out, but as Soki continues to defy Hideyoshi, Yodo begs her sister to stand down, only for Ohatsu to refuse to concede to a tyrant. This collective defiance is enough for Hideyoshi to prepare his power to kill them, but Yodo can't help but cry out to him, begging him to spare her sister, though he simply tells her not to exert herself since she is still pregnant. As she is about to continue, she notices a now present Claudius staring at her, and she is quick to back away and stop her protests, which Ohatsu also notices. Like normal, Tenkai is forced to block Hideyoshi's attack, and tells the party to escape back to Mount Hiei and find out why Hideyoshi has so much power, and they are forced to flee, with even Roberto realising that this is far beyond him as he helps them escape. As Tenkai is swallowed in the blast, the group manage to reach Enriaku and report the events to Arin, who while upset that Tenkai didn't survive, is at least happy that the rest of them are okay. Soki is surprised but glad that Roberto returned with them, though he simply grunts in acknowledgement. Internally, however, he is able to see that blindly hunting Luis while he is protected by Hideyoshi would be a losing battle. He also finds himself dwelling a little on the selfless sacrifice of Tenkai to save their lives, a little moved by his actions. Ohatsu sees a conflicted look on his face and asks if he's okay, but Roberto snaps back and just nods his head, only for her to thank him for saving her life from Munanori. While still not yet speaking to them, he acknowledges her gratitude and once again nods in response. With Tenkai lost, Arin decides to begin translating Roberto in his place, surprising everyone when she begins speaking Spanish as well. This might seem like a bit of a stretch at first, but remember that her presence in Demon Siege is the sole reason that the language barrier was overcome, and since Tenkai learned the language sometime after those events, it's not unreasonable to expect that Arin had done the same, if she even needed to. While Roberto is still not yet on Japanese-speaking terms, he at least remains cordial from here on out. With Jubei not involved in the story, and Roberto already with the group, stages 9 and 10 are skipped entirely, and while the group are unsure how to proceed, Roberto prepares to leave, Arin asking in Spanish where he's going. He explains, and she relays, that he is leaving to retrieve something that he left in the dungeons of Sawayama, and Soki and Ohatsu are quick to offer to help him. While he is hesitant, Ohatsu insists that he needn't do this on his own and put himself at risk of capture by Mitsunari or Luis, and Roberto sighs and concedes. Arin ends up deciding to go with them since they'll still need a translator for Roberto, and they return to Sawayama, with this being almost identical to canon, though instead of Jubei crawling through the gap to find the gear, Arin simply warps to it and retrieves it. They fight off the Genma Guardian once again, and return with Roberto's pendant in tow, and after a moment of hesitation, Roberto turns back to the group and utters a thank you in Japanese, surprising the group. After seeing them so willing to help him in something that didn't really concern them, he is able to finally accept that they are kinder than he first thought, becoming more willing to speak to them in Japanese. While he apologises for not saying anything, he tells them that he had his own personal reasons and the party decide not to pressure him into telling them, not wanting to burn this freshly built bridge between them. After some rest, they begin to discuss what their next step should be, and while they aren't certain how they can drain Hideyoshi's power, Roberto approaches and tells them of the Toyokuni facility in Sakai that spearheads Genma research. With Roberto now willingly talking to them, Arin doesn't need to accompany them this time. With his pendant being a key to get inside, the group agree that it is their best option and leave to infiltrate it. Inside, Roberto discovers the Genma's plan and tells them of the Dark Stone beneath the facility, and they begin hunting down and destroying the generators to access the basement. 
Even without Jubei, they are able to activate the elevator to reach the Dark Stone, only to be confronted by Claudius as they try to damage it. Claudius, having already discovered Roberto's possession of the exercising beads, attempts to kill Roberto before he even lands the first punch on the stone, but Soki still blocks it and challenges him while Roberto starts punching. While the fight is a little tougher without Jubei, Soki's Onimusha power is still the main obstacle for Claudius, and with Ohatsu's gunfire backing him up, Claudius is left defeated as Roberto manages to destroy the stone. Soki is quick to call out Claudius' identity, and once the Genma explains their plan, challenges him to try and stop them as he flees. The party return to Enryaku, and Roberto reveals the Genma's plan, as well as the existence of the Triumvirate, including the host bodies of Claudius and Rosencrantz. Realising that Luis's actions were Rosencrantz's rather than his own, Roberto is able to take a bit of comfort knowing his father was not a monster, though thinks that he still wants to be killed out of guilt. He still expresses uncertainty about Ophelia's host, expecting her to be close to Hideyoshi, but Ohatsu is quick to think that she cannot be her sister, mentioning her obvious fear while they were in Kyoto. The rest agree that she is probably right, especially considering she tried to convince Hideyoshi to spare them, and Ohatsu starts getting angry at the thought that Hideyoshi may not have treated her as well as she once thought. Soki is quick to calm her down, promising that they'll save Chacha when they return to face Hideyoshi again, and Roberto reminds them that they need to first destroy the second Dark Stone in Shimabara. While they worry about how they'll get there in time and return before the Omen Star descends, Minosuke speaks up and offers to warp them there, asserting that taking the party to and from Shimabara should be a simple task for him. Remember that Minokichi's young age and inexperience is what stopped him from not only warping the party great distances, but also to areas with too much Dark Essence. Neither of these issues were present with Minogoro's severed thread alone, so a fully grown living Mino should have no problem with a warp like this. Once the party rest and are ready to move, Minosuke warps them to Shimabara and they assault the facility, though not long after they leave, Tenkai is spat from hell and returns to the Oni Gate, surprising and delighting Arin. After she gives him the rundown, they have Minosuke warp him to Shimabara as well, and he rushes to catch up with the rest of the Oni. The party successfully destroy three generators, but find the final one blocked off by a small hole that none of them can fit through, only to hear Tenkai behind them promising a solution. The party are shocked but delighted to see him alive, and he is quick to contact Arin to warp in and destroy the generator for them once he tells them that his Oni Gauntlet refused to let him die. She soon appears within the walled off room and playfully jams the machinery with some nearby rocks, causing them to grind and eventually break, shutting off the final generator. With that, she gleefully tells them that they're good to go and walks back to Enryaku, leaving them to reach the basement and find the second Dark Stone. Since the Triumvirate didn't have any sort of heads up like they do in canon when witnessing them use the San Felipe, they didn't actually have time to prepare the Dark Stone to be suspended above them, so Roberto prepares once again to destroy it. As he is about to begin, Rosencrantz and Claudius both appear, immediately shifting Roberto's attention away from the stone to confront them. While they try to maintain their cool, they are noticeably worried about how quickly they were able to find and reach the second Dark Stone, and are ready to stop the Oni themselves, though as the Oni prepare to fight them off, the two are soon joined by Sakon, turning the fight into a 4v3. As he joins, the Genma launch their attack and the battle begins. While the Oni do outnumber the Genma, the battle proves rather difficult thanks to the Genma being so close to the Dark Stone. While Sakon doesn't get a boost from it, Claudius and Rosencrantz prove tricky to fight as a team. Tenkai and Soki swap between Claudius and Sakon, while Roberto is fixed on destroying Rosencrantz. But what starts tipping the battle into the Oni's favour is Ohatsu. With everyone already able to hold off their specific targets, Ohatsu is free to give supporting fire to anyone whenever necessary, while the Genma are each too occupied to be able to stop her. Over time, the Genma are backed into a corner, and knowing his ability to bind them when given the chance, Tenkai calls on Soki to purify Claudius rather than simply kill him. As Soki defeats Sakon, he draws Requiem and rushes in as Tenkai knocks Claudius to his knees, impaling the Genma and purifying him. 
While Claudius is initially confident that it will have no effect, his confidence turns to horror as he feels his essence purged by Soki's blade, screaming as he slowly fades into nothing and leaving only a weakened Mitsunari in the aftermath. While weakened, a still conscious Mitsunari demands to know what they just did, ranting that he was on the verge of witnessing the rise of the Genma, before being told to shut up as Soki turns towards a now terrified Rosencrantz. The scientist desperately attempts to flee, but this time Roberto decks him to the floor, giving Soki the chance to purify him as well. As Rosencrantz starts screaming, the screams are suddenly silenced as the Genma's essence fades from Luis's body, falling to his knees and panting as he finally regains control of himself. As this is happening, Tenkai uses his own purification art to break Ophelia's mask and frees Sakon from the Triumvirate's control as it crumbles away, though the lingering effects still cause him pain as they slowly fade. With Luis finally freed, he and Roberto share a tearful reunion, Roberto grateful beyond words that he didn't have to murder his father as he thanks Soki for saving him. Luis still expresses great shame and guilt for the deaths of his other children, but Roberto is quick to place the blame solely on Rosencrantz and the Genma, knowing Luis would have stopped it if he could. As for Mitsunari, he begins ranting that his plans to see a world of Genma have been ruined, but as the Oni are quick to threaten him into silence, Sakon is able to get back on his feet and try to talk his master down, telling him from experience that Genma power will only ever corrupt. While he is about to argue, he can see that he is in absolutely no position to say anything, and Sakon thanks the Oni for saving them too, grabbing his weakened master and leaving as he promises that they will not trouble the Oni again. With this hard-fought victory, Roberto takes the opportunity to destroy the Dark Stone, and they escape the facility with Luis, Minosuke soon warping them all back to Enriaku. While Arin is happy to hear that the Darkstones are no more, she's rather shocked to see Luis return with them, at least until realising that him being able to enter means that his possession must have been broken. She's given the rundown and is ecstatic to hear that not only Claudius and Rosencrantz are dead, but that Sohi was able to completely purify their hosts of their influence. With the Darkstones destroyed and only one member of the Triumvirate left alive, everyone agrees that this is the best time to make a final assault on Kyoto and defeat Hideyoshi. The party make their preparations and leave to stage their attack from the Akechi tomb once again, with Luis obviously remaining within Enriaku for safety, looking on with pride at the man Roberto has become. Meanwhile, in Kyoto, Ophelia is ranting at a slightly frustrated Hideyoshi that the Oni have managed to ruin their plans entirely, and expecting the Oni to be launching another attack on the festival, leaves to prepare a final stand against them. As Hideyoshi remains within Fushimi Castle to prepare for their arrival, he is approached by Yodo who begs his attention. Hideyoshi is once again quick to tell her not to exert herself so that both she and the baby won't get hurt, but she is insistent that it's important, and Hideyoshi, seeing her fear and desperation, decides to listen, his expression turning to one of fear and anger as she speaks. The party arrive at the Akechi tomb to see that the Genma mother tree has only just started uprooting Fushimi Castle, with there still being about a month and a half before the Omen Star completes its descent. They begin their assault, ploughing through the Genma that defend the city, but do not encounter Claudius or Rosencrantz like they do in canon. Not only is the Omen Star not yet close enough to exude enough Dark Essence to revive them, but the two were not only killed, but completely purified, so resurrection may not even be possible. As a result, the Oni are quick to reach Fushimi Castle to find only Hideyoshi, Ophelia, and Munanori waiting outside the latter of which having been strengthened by eating Genma insects. Ophelia can't help but angrily rant at them for so thoroughly impeding their plans and killing the rest of the Triumvirate, but while she rants, Hideyoshi remains oddly silent and composed. As she and Munanori prepare to fight the group, Ophelia looks back and begins to question Hideyoshi's silence, but as she notices him slowly building his power, she turns back and lunges at the Oni with Munanori. However, as the fight begins, Ophelia is suddenly struck in the back by a massive blast of dark energy, everyone turning to notice that Hideyoshi had outright attacked her instead, revealing to all that she had betrayed him. 
Munanori is baffled by this as well, and with him feeling more personal loyalty to her than to Hideyoshi, attempts to rush him, only for him to be floored as well. At this point, everyone, including the Oni, is completely blindsided by these actions, but Hideyoshi asks Soki to approach him, calling Yodo out from within the castle. Ohatsu is quick to call out to her, but Yodo asks her to listen to Hideyoshi just this once. While no one is certain what to think at this point, Soki draws his blade and slowly approaches, expressing that he had planned to face Hideyoshi himself anyway, but the Warlord tells him that that will no longer be necessary, further confusing everyone. Munanori and Ophelia attempt to get up and fight back, but Hideyoshi strikes them again, demanding that they stay down. Taking advantage, Tenkai tells Ohatsu and Roberto to keep the two from fighting back, and as they keep them in place, Hideyoshi asks Soki about his reputation for purifying. Hesitating for a moment at this question, Soki sheathes Lamentation and draws Requiem, telling him that it is capable of destroying any evil force, listing both the Genma trees and even Ohatsu as examples, explaining her previous infestation of Genma insects thanks to Munanori. Yodo's eyes widen at this revelation, not only just at hearing about Ohatsu's slavery, but also giving her a massive surge of hope, begging Hideyoshi to allow him to do the same. With almost a look of shame, Hideyoshi asks him to purify Yodo, revealing that she had also been infected without his knowledge, Yodo showing the insects as she reveals her bare shoulder. Ophelia reacts quickly with rage, telling Yodo that she should have been silent and attempting to trigger them while she has the chance, but Ohatsu, realising that Ophelia is the one who likely planted them, flies into a rage of her own as she begins raining gunfire on Ophelia until her body goes limp. As Soki calms her down, Tenkai notices a dark puddle slinking away and uses his charms to stop it in place and purify it, ending Ophelia and the Triumvirate once and for all. The two are quick to help Roberto keep Munanori down, the latter now more desperately trying to get back on his feet, but Roberto's raw strength is simply way too much for him to overcome. While Ohatsu is worried about the effect on her child, Tenkai assures that both Yodo and her child should survive the process, and Soki agrees to purify them, using Requiem to purge them both of the Genma insects. After a moment, Soki sheathes Requiem and Yodo checks again, only to realise that the insects are gone, beginning to break down as she thanks him repeatedly while Ohatsu is quick to rush to her side. With a clear hint of relief in his voice, Hideyoshi thanks Soki for saving her, seeing now just how second nature betrayal really is to the Genma, and beginning to regret his alliance with them. They all soon turn their attention to Munenori, and Tenkai, remembering his promise to Sekishusai, prepares to finish him off, but Ohatsu asks him to let her be the one to finish him, wanting to avenge her enslavement. Munenori can only rant at her, wishing that he had simply killed her instead of letting her live, but Ohatsu simply aims at his head and tells him that he could never have done so from the beginning, before firing a shot through his skull and instantly killing him. While the Oni briefly breathe a sigh of relief, they quickly remember that Hideyoshi is still present and remain on edge in case of another fight, but Hideyoshi tells them that he no longer wants to fight them, instead asking them that if Ophelia would betray him like this, is anything they told him the truth. Tenkai tentatively steps forward and reveals what they learnt in Sakai, including the fact that Hideyoshi would have only been a physical vessel for the true God of Light. Hideyoshi, realising that they lied to him from the very beginning, drops to his knees as the reality of his actions at their behest slowly dawns on him, apologising to Soki and thanking him for righting his wrongs. He then asks Soki to purify him as well, revealing the Genma seed in his chest and telling them that it kept his power fueled despite the destruction of the Dark Stones. But Tenkai, after taking a closer look, is able to simply remove the seed from Hideyoshi's chest and use an incantation to destroy it. With Hideyoshi's power now gone, Soki asks about the Genma Mother Tree, and Hideyoshi leads everyone inside the castle and presents the tree to them, telling them that his wife Nine was sacrificed to create it. While this does anger the party a bit, they are by now less phased by the fact since purifying it will likely save her life as well. 
Since not only is the star not close enough to the Earth, but the Genma Seed is already gone now, the tree does not awaken, so Soki is able to purify it without a fight, saving Nine and destroying the rest of the trees. Nine soon regains consciousness and begins berating Hideyoshi for his actions, but he just sits there and takes it, agreeing that he allowed the Genma to turn him into a monster. As the glow of the Omen Star begins to fade, everyone rushes outside to witness the Omen Star become resealed within the Underworld, preventing the resurrection of Fortinbras. With the battle now over, Hideyoshi turns to Soki and lowers his head, preparing for whatever punishment he sees fit. However, as Soki draws his blade, he eventually sheathes it again, deciding that enough people have already died, and instead demanding that he remove himself from power and never attempt to regain any again. While Hideyoshi is shocked at Soki's mercy, he remains grateful and expresses a hope that Soki may one day forgive him for his actions. Following the successful assault on Kyoto, Hideyoshi immediately orders for the foreign invasion to end, and once his forces return to Japan, he announces his immediate abdication as lord, leading to Ieyasu Tokugawa finally taking the opportunity to begin his own clan's conquest. From here on out, Hideyoshi chooses to spend the rest of his days in Osaka Castle with Yodo, being present at the birth of his son, Hideyori. While he knows that Hideyori would not become lord in the coming years, Hideyoshi would enjoy his days raising his son to be better than he was. With Munanori dead, Tenkai leaves for the Yagyu village to report to Sekishusai that his promise was kept, and Ohatsu, knowing her late mother's love for him, asks to go as well, not only as the one who killed Munanori, but to meet the man that her mother had once loved. The news of Munanori's death reassures Sekishusai and he thanks the monk, and while he is blindsided by the fact that Ohatsu is the middle daughter of Oichi, he takes solace in knowing that she grew to be much like her mother, and vows to ensure that no other Yagyu follows in Munanori's footsteps. Once Ohatsu returns from the Yagyu village, she and Soki end up marrying, Yodo choosing to support her decision upon seeing how happy she is, rather than push for her to marry Kiyogoku Takatsugu. With it being the place that they first met, the two decide to also reside within Osaka Castle for the foreseeable future, Soki also wanting to be there to keep a close eye on Hideyoshi. Upon returning to Enryaku, Tenkai works alongside Arin to reseal his gauntlet once more. While Roberto initially plans to return to Espana following Soki and Ohatsu's marriage, Luis decides instead that he wants to remain in Japan and work towards atoning for his actions while possessed by Rosencrantz. Not wanting to leave his father behind after only just getting him back, the two decide to open an orphanage in Osaka in memory of those lost to Rosencrantz's experiments, often receiving visits from Soki and Ohatsu over time. In 1595, Ieyasu and Mitsunari battle each other in Sekigahara, effectively starting the battle five years early. Mitsunari, still jaded at losing the Genma, makes a desperate attempt to grab for power following Hideyoshi's abdication, but the battle ends in Ishida's defeat, soon being publicly executed by Ieyasu. Three years later, suffering from illness, Hideyoshi is left bedridden near his wife, concubine and son, fading in and out of consciousness and clearly at death's door. On his deathbed, he is actually visited one last time by Soki, who upon seeing him keep his word for the past five years, finally forgives him for his actions. Knowing that he had finally earned Soki's forgiveness after five years, Hideyoshi would pass away on September 18th, 1598, with one final smile on his face. And that ends yet another story! After doing these what ifs for as long as I have, I'm surprised this one never actually came to mind. I'd like to thank BlackPaul3297 for suggesting this scenario. I quite enjoyed writing it, and while not quite as much changed as I expected, it did give way to a couple of new ideas like Hideyoshi turning on the Genma and using a Mino that wasn't Mino Goro or Mino Kichi, though I do wish I was able to expand on those ideas a bit more than I did in the end. I imagine that some may question why Hideyoshi would so quickly turn on the Genma like that, but it's honestly not that far off from his turn at the end of the game upon discovering Ophelia's deception, and given how much he was said to have adored Yodo, Ophelia effectively using her as a hostage would likely enrage him more than enough to turn on her. 
While I did also like the idea of having Arin get a bit more involved in events since Jube was too young to be around, I do kinda wish I was able to give her more moments. In the end, however, I decided to give her more quirky moments akin to her appearances in the mangas, including Twilight of Desire, which I have finally had the chance to read through properly. It has yet to be fully translated, but I can promise you that it is definitely coming sometime in the future. On another note, I do have to apologise for how long this took to finish despite being a much shorter scenario. As I've mentioned in a recent video, I would have likely gotten this out a couple of weeks earlier had I not spent the majority of January a bit on the ill side, so I wasn't really able to work on anything. But I'm all good now, and I do have a few videos planned for the foreseeable future, so I hope that's something worth looking forward to. Anyway, I've rambled enough now, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks for watching everybody, and take care of yourselves. Danish out.